not very advanced <laughs> technology. Um, I'm very happy to welcome here today Tanner Merkley. It's not his first time here and uh, he has been um, at IAC last year as well. He's a very uh, frequent visitor for the, some of the studios as a guest uh, jury and, and critique. Some of you, you will be having um, a session with him tomorrow. Um, Tanner Merkley, he is a project architect at AMO and OMA. Very little things to do about, to say about um, OMA, founded by Rem Hulgas, but has been uh, um, a, a very pioneer a place of research and architectural production, always taking into consideration contemporary issue of politics and economics, uh, business, culture, uh, uh, and how all these are affecting the architectural production. Tanner has been working uh, in many of the projects that are, in a way, working with some of the paradoxes of, of many of um, um, the, the, the views that we have about uh, our world and um, it's always nice to see that kind of critical point of view but also how this criticism or how this uh, discussion can be applied into an architectural proposal. So we're very happy to have uh, Tanner here today with us and uh, please help me welcome him. Great, thanks for the warm welcome. I have to uh, just apologize because I have a bit of a cold, so I'm gonna have a high voice today. <laughs> um, so basically I've been working at OMA and AMO for the last decade, and I think one of the things that I, I feel has um, been very inspiring is that you work with so many interesting people, and the office uh, is, um, it gives you the, the kind of sense when you're working there of that moment uh, about a week before your final graduation project where th there's a kind of buzz in the in the studio and there's things that you thought were not possible uh, all of a sudden start to kind of come together and uh, become possible. And so that for me is one of the things that I find really um, inspiring about working there. And it's probably why I've actually stuck around, one of the few people that actually have stayed there for so many years. But it, it's just that that is the kind of um, inspiring, engaging um, situation that, that's happening. So I'm going to go through uh, the, our, our kind of, a little bit of the history of our office, a little bit of history of uh, how we work and the process behind uh, AMO and OMA. And, and we're going to talk about sustainability. And when we talk about sustainability, you have to talk about Buckminster Fuller. Uh, I'm not sure if uh, you know about Buckminster Fuller or if you researched them, but if you're interested in the topic of uh, sustainability in general, it's a really good place to uh, start. And like he's saying here, in our office, you have to be much more than uh, just an architect. So you probably know our office from the books that we've uh, produced over over the last uh, 30 years. Probably the most the most famous is uh, Delirious New York um, and SML XL, of course. And uh, recently, the Elements of Architecture, which was basically the kind of in the the foundation of the last uh, Venice uh, Biennale. Uh, but we we use books as a way of helping us uh, frame and articulate our own arguments, our own thoughts, and trying to kind of uh, go deeper into those areas and, and reflect through uh, the, the process of writing but also the process of making in our, in our, um, in our buildings. So some of the buildings, which you probably know, uh, uh, the Villa Bordeaux, where we, we started to kind of innovate and, and look at how um, you could inhabit uh, floors and how the elevator and, and a floor could actually start to kind of merge together. And I think one of the big distinct uh, differences in our office, uh, as opposed to some other offices, is that we focus a lot of a lot of our energy on typological innovation, uh, where a lot of offices are. are a bit more focused on uh, stylistic kind of uh, signature and so we, we're constantly trying to um, not 
get into a, a particular style, but actually focus on what makes the building function and how it, it, it actually could be rethought. So again, the Kunsthalle, where we started to look at folding uh, floors and how those could be inhabited in different ways. The, the um, Seattle Public Library, where we looked at fixed program and, and flexible program, and, and then by stacking them and giving space between, the architecture actually becomes the, the in-between space, which is not uh, sorry the, the in-between space where it, it um, becomes the kind of uh, the architecture of the, the the programmatic kind of arrangement then uh, Casa de Musica where this is all about sonography and how we engage with the with the public the rehearsals and also about high performance acoustical spaces and so we really started making the the, the program work in an optimal way and then we wrapped the program uh, in a skin and the in between the interstitial space between that that program actually became this kind of interesting dialogue between the public and the users of the building. A similar idea in uh, CCTV where we made uh, this, this building is uh, around the same size as the World Trade Center towers in, in Manhattan, but we folded it together into a loop and we uh, created a public passage where the, the public can actually just walk and wander through the whole building and peek into areas where you don't normally get to uh, see, especially Especially in, in China in this kind of very opaque uh, bureaucratic structure. So that was our kind of intervention where we could start to subvert the normal practice and the normal typologies of a high rise but also of a kind of very uh, closed government building. bit of a delay here. Uh, and then also the Rotterdam, which is in our hometown where our, where our office is based. This is an idea where we, we started to stack program. So uh, this is a, a hotel, this is an office, and this is a residential tower. And there's only six meters uh, dividing the, the buildings. But actually, the hotel has a different 24-hour uh, usability cycle than the office, than the residential. And so it actually starts to work. And so by actually organizing the program in a different way, you can actually create new typologies of, of buildings. And our, one of our recent projects is the, um, the Prada uh, 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 Foundation in Milan, where it's basically a, camp, a cultural campus for their, their art collection. And this is looking at the uh, innovation of materiality and um, uh, scenography of how you curate uh, a building. But I'm not, I'm not going to talk about um, uh, our buildings tonight, I'm going to talk about AMO. And this is another uh, uh, part of our office which is less known. Uh, it's, a lot of people are very curious about it. It's very difficult to define it. But I think uh, for me actually working in AMO about half the time that I've been in OMA, um, I start to sort of see that there, it's really just applying architectural analysis and thought to non-architectural issues. And through that we were able to kind of generate a kind of uh, innovation. And so our website talks about it as uh, we're working on the periphery of architecture in politics, renewable energy, and technology. And I thought this was actually quite interesting that uh, Chris Durkin, at the opening of our uh, exhibition at the Barbican in 2010, he talked about AMO as, as um, making architecture without architecture. And I thought that was a very poetic way of, of talking about it because sometimes you need to actually create things that don't exist to be able to even define a brief for them. So our office, uh, AMO and OMA, we operate in very um, a sort of a cloud of, of sort of interests and fascinations. And tonight I'm going to uh, focus on the, these three, the AMO, sustainability, and politics. But of course we work in many other sort of uh, areas and disciplines and that's actually what makes it so interesting is that I've actually worked in all those different sort of like um, concentrations in the office, which gives you kind of new insight and new kind of uh, uh, makes you rethink the profession and rethink what you're actually doing and your job and your role as an architect. Um, we have five offices uh, globally, uh, so we're, we're sort of uh, present in a lot of uh, the, the world, and our office is basically made up of uh, 40 different nationalities, and I just heard that your school is also made up of about 40 different nationalities. And I think what's so interesting about this kind of cultural clash is that it starts to um, give different perspectives and different sort of insights that you may or may not have thought of before. And, and having that, that perspective allows you to 
sort of liberate yourself to rethink what um, what you are actually doing or or how you've actually been trained and and maybe questioning those those ideas. Rainier de Graaf, who gave a lecture here, uh, I think last year, he also talks about AMO as a sort of nuclear reactor. Reactor. I mean, it's uh, when I first started working at OMA, I thought it was very um, bizarre that we were working in. Um, very inefficient conditions where, you know, uh, we were working on a project and, and there was people from, say, the, the country where the project was from, but it was completely staffed with other people and I thought that doesn't make any sense. But now, looking back, it was actually engineered that way to try to kind of look at an, an old issue with a new kind of uh, set of uh, ideas. So it's, it's a, actually really a, a strategic model that the office uses to kind of generate innovation. And of course, we have our, uh, the, the head uh, partner, Rem Kulhas, who's extremely fascinating person, many, many layers of, of kind of complexity and depth. It's a, 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 com, a complete wild ride when you work with him. Um, and he also doesn't really, he hates the idea that people try to pin the office down into kind of one sort of process or a one-liner. And he also, he says here, he reserves the right to change the process at any time. And it's true. I mean, the, pr the process is constantly shifting. It's really unpredictable. I think the thing that we find there is that it's, you don't, the only thing predictable is that you don't really know where it, it will end up. Um. But in a way, it's a kind of positive kind of collision where you have uh, different architects, uh, different uh, collaborators, different cultures all coming together. And it's actually a, a, um, forming a kind of a debate and a discussion uh, and actually searching for the, the most interesting kind of solution and the best answer. And actually, in the end, it becomes a kind of a series of uh, uh, a collage of, of the intentions and ideas and, and innovations from the entire team. And so everyone becomes a kind of a creator but everyone also becomes a, a critic in the process. And I think that that, in the other slide, I, I didn't mention it, but it's really, the office focuses on the role of the critic more than the creator. And so what, what, that, what happens is we're able to kind of constantly adapt and change to different sort of phenomena and, and, and uh, different types of projects. So it, give, it sort of also liberates the office and, and allows it to kind of expand its, its reach and its kind of uh, um, way to kind of intervene. So a simple diagram, we have a lot of different people together and more is better and uh, we, we develop better ideas through this kind of interaction and collaboration. Uh, and when you combine that with really fascinating clients, uh, really ambitious clients, you get very kind of uh, interesting uh, results. And one of the things that we uh, always do in, in AMO is we're constantly reflecting on our uh, on ourself and on the economy and on the kind of global situation to try to um, put our uh, try to connect what we're doing to the actual situation and the actual kind of conditions because architecture is in a way just a, a kind of byproduct of politics, uh, economy, uh, culture, and it, it starts to kind of congeal into a sort of form. And and so by understanding Understanding those conditions and understanding the context that we're working, it helps us reflect and understand and position what we're actually doing and and the kind of role that we're actually playing in the in the entire kind of uh, um, development of a building. And so. Um, I want to touch a little bit about on the market economy because this is also quite interesting and, and this is a condition which we find ourselves in and we're constantly questioning actually. If I, I was looking, thinking back to all the biennales that we've been involved in which is probably uh, almost everyone uh, for the last 10 years and it, it always comes back to this idea of the market economy and the, and the implications of what is actually happening and the byproducts of this. So one of the things that before the market economy, um, Buckminster Fuller in 1965 gave an address to the Association of American Architects and Planners and basically what he started his lecture off with was that we're on a, um, a large uh, spaceship that has a limited amount of fuel and resources and we weren't given an operating manual and so he basically proposed that he would write an operating manual for this kind of spaceship. And he turned that idea into a pavilion that was done in Montreal in 1967. It was basically a biosphere, but the idea behind the biosphere was that it was filled with kind of innovative technology and innovative um, uh, sustainable um, um, ways of, of organizing and, and organizing society. But shortly after this, the market economy started to kind of like pull away and, and take off. And, and these two people met, and the rest is history as we know. But it's basically uh, started to kind of congeal and, and form a, a, 
this is what we in our office call the yes regime, which is basically the West, the kind of Western dominance, uh, the economic dominance, which actually starts to kind of filter into our own architectural production and actually changes the way that we think about space and, and the way that we kind of approach the, the project and the way the clients interact with us, which is actually a fundamental shift. If you go back in time, it was different a little bit before. So it's something to be aware of and just be kind of uh, critical of. Ironically, six years later, uh, Buckminster Fuller, uh, his biosphere uh, mysteriously caught, uh, caught fire and it burned down. But actually, the sustainable uh, technologies that were being kind of uh, presented here were not very profitable. So it doesn't really fit into the kind of market economy's uh, agenda. And it was sort of, it's faded away into the background, but we're going to come back to it a bit later in our, in our presentation. So AMO and sustainability, how did we get involved in sustainability? Because actually this was never our primary agenda. Actually we were mostly interested in the byproduct of politics, economics, and, and culture, and how architecture is kind of generated out of that, or how we can innovate in, those, in, in this uh, situation. So one of the first projects which actually started to, to turn into kind of AMO, or at least inside of our office, we began to kind of um, organize the office into two separate types of offices. One sort of a think tank around non-architectural issues and one a kind of uh, architectural, a traditional architectural office where we were developing buildings. Um, and this was basically, uh, Schiphol Airport asked us to look at their airport and, and make a kind of proposal for an extension of the airport or an expansion of the airport. So we started, as we normally do, mapping and analyzing the situation. And then we realized that actually, also using the kind of market economic sort of a thought process that by simply uh, taking a, an area which was the airport in one of the most densely populated parts of uh, the Netherlands where it affects a lot of people uh, you also have uh, oh, this is very sensitive you also have um, uh, uh, flight paths that basically also affect thousands of people's homes uh, acoustically. And our proposal was, why don't we just move the airport into the North Sea, and then we solve this whole issue, and then we liberate all this area for you know future potential development. This wasn't part of the brief. This wasn't what we were asked to do. This is just a proposal that we made to Schiphol, and it actually created like, a huge kind of like buzz, and it was published in the newspaper. And but we didn't really know what we were doing. It wasn't urban it wasn't architecture, it wasn't economics, it was something new, and that's how AMO was basically born. And then later we went, uh, I'll show you later in the presentation, we started working more in the North Sea, which kind of ties this all together. So we, we also were doing speculative kind of, uh, this is a, a speculative project in the North Sea of the airport of how it could actually kind of be realized later. So we started, uh, the European Union uh, also was kind of formulating around that time uh, becoming more coherent and more clear. I mean, the, originally the European Union was developed and designed to basically kind of create political and economic stability for Europe. Um, and so, but the, it wasn't, um, uh, it wasn't sort of reflecting the the kind of situation of Europe and how it was actually kind of uh, changing. And so we were basically asked by the European Commission to have a, a look at the state of Europe and reflect about on, on how the future of Europe could actually be. And so instead of having uh, 12 stars, at that point I think there was uh, over 20 countries uh, that were already in the EU, we thought maybe what we should actually do is make the, the European flag much more uh, a kind of a process of accumulation of, of, of countries and an aggregation of complexity. Um, this also wasn't, we didn't, we weren't asked to do this, but we did it anyway, and actually it, it, it went quite far, I mean, to the point where it was actually used by the Euro European Commission, and George W. Bush actually gave a presentation with this on his uh, kind of uh, uh, podium. Uh, we, we did a, an installation, it was a circus, it was a giant tent in Brussels, so in the drab kind of bureaucratic backdrop of the, the city. And we kind of started to unpack the layers of the history of the European uh, Union and also of the, all the European countries, because to understand Europe, it's, you have to understand the history of Europe. And so we, we essentially, inside the tent, we made this giant installation, exhibition, basically looking at the past and moving towards the future 
future of and speculating on how it could actually evolve and how it could change. And so this was actually a, a moment when the European Union started to kind of really rethink what Europe was and how and where it was actually headed and what, what they should do. I mean, we also criticized parts of uh, Europe. I mean, we, we tried to promote complexity and com promote depth and promote understanding and uh, maintain difference and uh, between cultures, but we were critical here about all of the different sort of uh, codes and policies. And so this was a book that we made, which was five meters long, of all the different policies of each country, which were more or less either the same or sometimes contradictory, but a lot of redundancy was in place. And we, we basically told them that if you don't streamline the kind of uh, the sort of way you do law and, and policy, Europe will never kind of move forward. And so this was actually kind of a very a, 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 an eye-opener for some of the politicians and it actually helped through visualizing this uh, this kind of very cumbersome kind of political uh, bureaucratic situation. It, it kind of opened up people's eyes and allowed for new possibilities and new kind of ideas to emerge. So the North Sea, I'll go back now to the North Sea. We basically were, at a certain moment, the, the European Union was starting to increase its uh, uh, energy needs. Uh, the oil that was available in the North Sea were starting to deplete, and there was an increased uh, dependence on countries like Russia for oil and gas. And I mean, Europe was happily kind of accepting these uh, arrangements, but in the background, they were also looking for a more politically and economically stable uh, condition to kind of operate in, uh, and not have too many eggs in one basket, let's say, of, of our energy sort of uh, needs. So we started looking at the North Sea, and the North Sea is very interesting because it's very shallow, and it's also extremely windy. So it's actually the perfect place to look for, look at energy and how energy could kind of be harvested uh, in Europe. So we started with uh, the North Sea is basically bordered by seven countries. Uh, the the, the border looks like this. There's an international water border. And they basically, there's about 600 uh, oil platforms uh, by the seven countries which exist there. Um, and they're all kind of in their own sort of uh, uh, border, let's say. The oil production is uh, dramatically dropping. So they're run basically, it's becoming uh, dry. Uh, and so the idea is very simple that we'll replace this uh, oil infrastructure with uh, renewable energy energy infrastructure. And they were looking for, uh, they, nobody was really doing this kind of uh, urban planning, and so they asked us if we would be interested. And we said, of course, because it was uh, A, on a very big scale, and B, it was a kind of urban plan in the sea, where you normally are working on urban plan in the land, uh, on land, so this was a very kind of interesting model to kind of like consider, and we were just fascinated to see how the geopolitics, if we could actually work, make a, make a uh, interesting and uh, um, relevant plan, how they could actually shift the, the whole geopolitical kind of discussion in Europe. So basically what happened in, in 2008, each country was, these white dots are, are the uh, wind, offshore wind uh, parks that were being built, uh, but they were all being built by private uh, companies. And so it's very expensive to run a, a, direct, a cable to land out to um, access these, uh, these winter farms. So it actually becomes completely uneconomical to, to do it like this. So the first thing that we started to do is analyze how we could actually make the whole thing more economically efficient. So one idea was that we would actually run a giant cable in a loop, in a sort of a ring around the North Sea, and then we would allow those wind farms to actually tap into that cable, and then we would only have a few points where it would actually go to land as a sort of a main uh, kind of infrastructural intervention. And then over time, that would basically, uh, the wind farms could actually gather and, and um, uh, condense and sort of densify around, around that infrastructural ring. So basically, everyone would benefit through collaboration and it would, it would actually start to first unify this, this uh, whole region, which at that time was actually divided because they were battling over oil grounds. So it was actually a completely different sh um, uh, shift on how to kind of uh, occupy this sort of in-between space between countries.
So we had all these kind of fantasies of how that would actually be, where you could have electric ships docking and refueling. Uh, we could use the empty caverns from all the pumping oil and gas to basically put, uh, uh, you know, uh, it's called carbon capture storage, where you basically take the, the, the CO2 and you compress it and you put it back into the ground. And, um, and we also uh, envisioned a kind of collaborative uh, research hub, which could be connected to the different universities, but w would focus on developing sustainable innovation. And that was this, this building in the background. And that could actually happen where all the borders join together in the middle. And so we thought this could be similar to the, um, the International Space Station where all the countries that are um, uh, collaborating to make this thing possible, that could happen also in the North Sea where it actually becomes a, a huge collaborative effort which could have very interesting byproducts where new jobs could be created, patents could be made, um, and sustainable innovation could, could actually kind of uh, evolve in a, in a rapid way. And Europe could actually lead this whole uh, uh, sustainable revolution. And so that was our original proposal uh, to the, the North Sea. And and one of the things that we started to look at is we, and we started to calculate, and this is when we became extremely enthusiastic about sustainability and energy, is that we started to see that if you optimize the North Sea and this infrastructural ring, you would potentially have more energy capacity than the entire Middle East uh, in their fossil fuel kind of production. So basically what we discovered here was that, that um, in the North Sea, Europe actually had a kind of sustainable Saudi Arabia in their backyard and they didn't even know it. And so we were extremely interested in how this would actually shift the entire geopo geopolitics of energy and uh, allow Europe to basically be much more self-sufficient and less dependent on other um, cultures which have different sort of uh, political affiliations and positions than, than Europe does. So this was where it was all kind of born, and this was the kind of eureka moment when we started to look at this potential and how that could actually, um, by intervening in the North Sea and, and using energy and infrastructure, you could actually really, for the first time, unite Europe, and not only through a kind of branding and sort of like symbolic means, but actually with a very physical, concrete, infrastructural uh, intervention, which would actually make sense to kind of like uh, have happen. And then we got a little bit carried away. We started started thinking, well, what if we added other uh, things like solar and hydro? And, and then that was where it was all kind of uh, born as the idea behind our position and our kind of interest in sustainability and how we could actually influence um, the, the profession on a big scale. Uh, two years later, Rem was invited to join, it was called the Reflection Group, where it was basically a lot of leaders and innovators in their respective fields in Europe, where they basically were brainstorming of the future of how the European Union could evolve. We were still proposing, uh, the, uh, we had this fascination with the kind of diversity and complexity and how uh, we could uh, still kind of develop this as an idea. Um, we were still fascinated with the idea of kind of aggregation of countries and, and into the EU, and we were asking a lot of questions, and which basically led to uh, a manifesto that we wrote called the Declaration of Interdependence. And the Declaration of Interdependence was basically this idea of collaborating through energy infrastructure to actually form a real European Union and be bound by, by other means than just sort of ideological means. So the proposal that we originally made was to uh, elaborate this idea and actually expand it into all different kind of realms. But this was a very conceptual idea that we had and an intuition and a hunch and we didn't really know if that was even possible or how that would work or what would actually happen uh, in, uh, to this idea. What was interesting, though, is around the same time, the European Union had just agreed to reduce their CO2 emissions by 80% by 2050. And then uh, shortly after, the European um, Union kind of stepped back and they said to themselves, is that even physically possible? Did we just sign ourselves up for something that we can't even uh, do? So they basically created a kind of task force or a kind of group of uh, people in Europe who are their respective leaders. So this was basically what their ambition was to kind of reduce CO2 emissions by 80%. 
And so they invited uh, the leaders in analytics and politics, in uh, e um, economy, in um, grid infrastructure, in policy, and they also invited us because of our kind of experience with the North Sea and because of our interest in sort of um, urban planning on large scales and sort of uh, this in-between sort of uh, position as an architect and urban planner. So we got, uh, it was actually fascinating to work with all these people because they were all experts uh, and we learned so much. So it was actually a kind of like uh, a school almost where you're really learning all of the latest kind of, and you're reading reports that were not even published. There was raw data that was being generated and it was very kind of uh, inspiring to work in that kind of context. So immediately what we did was we defined the brief um, and we looked at areas where we could reduce energy to try to kind of reduce CO2 emissions and where we couldn't potentially reduce energy to try to give a bit more of a framework because it was such a big task to kind of look at it. It was so abstract. We had to start to make it more tangible. Um, one thing we noticed, which was kind of uh, ironic, was that everyone was interested in sustainability at that time. It was being, it was on, on every kind of uh, newspaper, magazine, everyone was talking about it. Al Gore had just made a movie. So everyone was sort of talking about it, but nobody, it seemed like nobody really knew what they were talking about. And that was the other thing that was interesting is when you're actually working with the experts, you started to realize that, that everyone's just throwing numbers around, but it's actually almost doesn't illiterate uh, in the energy mean, sort of like the same thing in um, um, understanding. So we started to make this graph where we thought, okay, everyone's sort of aware and everyone's interested, but actually the scale of action, which is should be happening, is actually the inverse uh, relationship and so everyone was talking about it but no one was doing anything and we also noticed that in our own profession where basically architects were being given uh, sustainability awards you know and we were we were thinking okay architects maybe contribute to a very small percentage of the whole entire built escape of the entire world of uh, even smaller percentage of those architects are contributing to sustainability and it turns out even a smaller percentage are actually having an impact on sustainability and this building the strata in London is an interesting example because it was kind of lauded as this uh, a major innovation in sustainability where they had three wind turbines on the roof it was going to provide 10% of the the energy for the building but in the end, the wind turbines don't even turn, and they only turn them on with electricity to kind of show as a symbol that London is sustainable, but it's actually not sustainable. And we noticed that through kind of uh, the whole industry, uh, through other industries, there was this kind of trend in greenwashing, which actually ties back into the market economy, where it was actually very profitable to focus on kind of rebranding your products and your and your kind of uh, position in the market and sort of following the trends. But actually, no one was actually contributing to the the kind of uh, reduction of CO2. So, and then in the political sphere, this also was happening, and so everyone was, uh, you know enthusiastically kind of embracing these ideas uh, but what we what we found was to be the kind of absolute irony is that the, the people that were the worst contributors or the worst offenders are the ones that have the biggest smile in this image and so you can see that this is their carbon uh, CO2 footprint <laughs> so <laughs> Also, at that at that time, this is when the um, the uh, this hockey stick graph came out, which had a lot of controversy around it. But it it started to indicate that there was something very wrong, and uh, we weren't really sure what was happening. But we started to investigate for ourselves. Uh, we we first started looking at how much um, CO2 is actually being produced, and then we started to realize that actually, of, of course, the, the the U.S. is the the arch polluter of all uh, of all the countries. So this is um, these are all the different uh, continents and countries. Uh, this is the the grand total of all those countries together of their CO2 output. Um, but what this the America doesn't look so bad in this photo. But what what the, is hard to tell here is that the population is relatively small to their energy footprint. But if you start to apply the American model to countries like India and China, which is the way it's going right now, the situation gets much more kind of desperate where it actually would start to kind of uh, increase the CO2 output by about 500%, which uh, then makes that hockey stick graph look like a kind of best case scenario. 
Uh, what we also noticed was that there was a more an increase in frequency of, a, a, of kind of natural disasters and events around the world. I mean, this is also, we thought, okay, well, this is also very anecdotal, like maybe, how do you know, how, you know, how do we really assess the kind of frequency of these, these disasters? Um, there was a lot of you know articles and publications of scientists kind of verifying this, um, and they, they were basically saying that you know the storm of the century is now becoming uh, the storm of the decade and and the uh, storm every, every 20 years, and that there will be much more kind of uh, frequency in these radical kind of conditions. The thing that made it more clear and more concrete to us is that we started to add, we started to overlay data uh, of uh, temperature rising, uh, natural disaster frequency, and then we also included. Um, the insurance premiums from insurance companies for these these cities, I and mean, we started to see there was, a, there was a direct correlation between the increased expenditures of the cost of the natural disasters with the temperature rising. So this started to uh, this graph started to make much more sense to us that there was somehow a correlation. To make to compound the situation a little bit more, Europe was running out of fuel. We were becoming more and more dependent on on Russia and the Middle East, and this was also creating more and more um, kind of uh, price discrepancies. And, and at that time, I mean, now it's a little bit different, but at that time, the, the energy prices were rising. So countries like Germany were basically starting to kind of take it into their own hands. They were building uh, coal, coal plants. I mean, this looks like a Photoshop image, but this is actually a real image near Dresden, where they basically built this coal plant right next to a residential community. But it was basically, the, each country was trying to get control of their energy energy situation and it was having a profound impact on the urban environment and on, on the architectural sort of surroundings. The tension was building, there was a lot of protest, something had to be done and so and uh, there was also kind of like uh, a lot of uh, independent individual efforts were happening. Like for instance, Germany was building, um, you know, uh, solar panels in Germany, which doesn't make sense. The you know the mafia uh, in Sicily was using uh, energy s or subsidies for green energy to build wind turbine uh, plants, but they weren't connecting them to the grid. There was just a kind of money laundering scheme. France was using biofuel, which was very kind of inefficient. So everyone was sort of trying to do something about it in their own way, but it was a kind of uncoordinated effort. So this is how we envision, uh, this is how we saw the situation in Europe. It was basically an archipelago of kind of um, um, uh, misguided intentions, let's say. And our idea, what we proposed to the EU, was that we actually just try to, we need to kind of unify and have a long-term uh, kind of strategy where we can really make a kind of impact and invest in a more strategic way. So we, we basically propose that we, we really need to kind of uh, work together uh, to actually form a real European Union, but a kind of a green-focused European Union to make it actually work. And the thing that was interesting about Europe is that it actually has a very uh, wide kind of uh, geographic kind of diversity, which is perfect for renewable energy. Because the problem with renewable energy is uh, when it's sunny, then you're producing energy uh, if you're using solar. But when the sun goes down, you still have demand for energy, maybe even more demand for energy. And sometimes when it's windy, you have demand or production of energy with wind turbines. But when the wind stops, then you run out of energy. So there's always this kind of argument of, you know, how do we kind of uh, keep the supply and demand in check? So what we started to investigate was that actually what you need to do is you need to have a lot of different sources of uh, these kind of renewable energies combined together and overlapping with each other so that, for instance, when it's sunny in the south, in, in the south of Europe, then, and it's not windy in the north, that will kind of compensate. And then when it's windy in the north, it will kind of compensate for the lack of sun. And when you add more and more of these kind of technologies together and you combine them, you end up actually, what we, what we were surprised by was these are the, the spiky kind of lines are basically each country's um, fossil fuel sort of like analysis of how they uh, deal with supply and demand. 
And the green line is basically that if we kind of unify this sustainable, this renewable energy sort of infrastructure, we can actually make the demand much more constant over the entire country. The problem is that we need to have somehow a kind of a large scale uh, grid to make this possible where when energy is produ being produced in Norway, it can actually make it to kind of Italy where they, there may be a kind of, uh, demand issue. This seems like very kind of uh, abstract and very kind of um, difficult to imagine, but it, it is possible. So I'll, I'll explain it a little bit later. And then this was a way we kind of also explained it that Europe actually has to become a team where everyone has a sort of a, a, a specialty and you can do more when you kind of work together uh, to, to make it um, possible. So what we did was we redrew the the political boundaries of the European uh, uh, Union, and we focused on looking at different uh, energy potentials. And that we we said that the European Union should focus on giving sort of subsidies and investment to where it makes sense to do solar, and where it makes sense to do kind of tidal, and where it makes sense to do wind, and then work together to kind of like make it happen in a sort of very strategic long-term kind of uh, idea. So here's Barcelona. This was our collage. I was corrected when I gave this presentation in Rotterdam uh, that the solar panels were facing the wrong way, but uh, <laughs> we're from Rotterdam. There's no sun, so we don't really know these things. But, uh, but in uh, Britain, um, they have huge kind of tidal uh, uh, currents. Like it, when we worked on a project in London, we, I was surprised to know that the, the, the Thames actually moves up and down two or three times a day, almost seven meters. So there's a huge kind of tidal potential there. And so we call that the tidal states. Finland and uh, Hungary have uh, hu massive quantities of uh, um, trees and, and, and biomass that could be used for fuel. So we call that biomassberg. A lot of potential for uh, uh, um, hydro all over in the highlands of Europe, and so we call this hydropia. And, uh, and in the Alps, there's uh, geothermal potential. And this is where we started to say that maybe the energy infrastructure could actually become a kind of co combined leisure infrastructure, where actually it could be something more than just sort of banal sort of interventions in the landscape, but it could actually become a sort of destination. The, to tackle the idea of the grid, we started to investigate how that would work, and this was a diagram that we made to try to help conceptualize it for ourselves. that actually maybe Europe needs to think about the, this grid as a kind of metro map of different hubs and different sort of networks, and that metro map could also start to kind of reinvent and reformulate uh, the kind of transport system of Europe, which is also fragmented and segmented, and so that the, the, this metro map could actually be a kind of high-speed train network combined with a kind of high capacity grid, a new sort of grid that would actually allow electricity and, and power to be kind of shifted around Europe in a much more fluent way. The problem with Europe at the moment, which we found, was that each country has its own network, and it's only connected through a very small emergency network line. And basically, what we were proposing is that to make that emergency connection and make that the actual main sort of superhighway connection, and then all the regular uh, um, country kind of networks would actually become the tree, uh, the branches of that larger kind of tree infrastructure. And so everyone would be kind of contributing, just like in the North Sea where it was a ring, everyone would be contributing to this kind of spinal sort of uh, structural network to share and, and collaborate. And then we could develop more and more kind of uh, energy sort of uh, interventions around that grid, which would basically all kind of tie together, forming this new kind of collaborative uh, European Union. So to visualize that a little bit, we made um, these kind of high-speed train network with uh, with a kind of high-capacity uh, cables. And what we, what we are also trying to show is that actually the landscape doesn't change so much. Uh, uh, and that's what a lot of people were worried is that there would be um, you know wind turbines everywhere uh, but actually we, when we showed how many you would actually need and where they would actually be it started to become much more realistic which kind of calmed the sort of um, fear of a lot of people in in the kind of who were against the proposal so just to kind of like conclude this idea, uh, we we basically the the idea that we had was that the the, the future wouldn't actually be this kind of sci-fi future, but it would actually look 
basically just like today. The only difference would be that everything would be a little bit more efficient. So the cars wouldn't be um, using diesel fuel, they'd be electric. Windows on the houses wouldn't be uh, single glazed, they'd be triple glazed. Uh, different materials would have much more kind of high efficiency kind of coefficients. Everything would sort of look like it does today, but it would actually perform in a very, very different sort of way. So that was the big kind of like idea that we, we proposed is that the future isn't actually that scary and it's very possible. Um, and now, since they've accepted this kind of policy, you start to see the rolling out of this idea as it's being kind of like implemented across Europe. And this wasn't even uh, possible, you know, six years ago. And now you start to see it in almost every city, this kind of, uh, you know, um, cars that are electric, which can just charge right on the street. I mean, this also takes a lot of coordination and uh, organization to put this infrastructure there to make that possible. But as soon as it's there, everyone starts to kind of, uh, the whole economics behind it start to shift. So we were proposing to make Europe a little bit more green. Now, after that, after that project, there was a lot of enthusiasm and there was a lot of interest. And we were basically asked by a kind of a global NGO called the WWF to, to kind of look at this idea and try to scale it up to a global scale. And that was where we started to think, okay, it, it could be possible because, I mean, it, it, Zgrac, or in the North Sea, we made a, a similar uh, intervention as we did to Europe. So we thought, well, why can't we do that for the world? But the problem with the world is that it is very vast and it's very um, difficult to kind of start to collect all the data because every country has different data sets and everything is a little bit um, less consistent than in working with the EU. So what we started to do is we started to take it on our own hands inside the office, which is also quite interesting because this is where we started to develop. We've always been mapping things, but this is where we started to get really serious about mapping. Uh, the first thing that we did was we started to look at how maps are presented. The first map is the one that we always see. Uh, it's called the Mercator projection, and basically that is a, a, a globe, a, a ball that's rolled flat. But what happens is it creates like immense distortion here. Greenland is enormous. Russia looks huge. And the, the Arctic, uh, Antarctica looks like the same landmass as the whole world. But if you use um, this Dimaxian projection, which was actually developed and proposed by Buckminster Fuller in the 60s, it, gives, it triangulates the globe, but it gives much more kind of a clear um, overview of how the world actually is organized and looks. And so just like a set of drawings for a building, if you have a, a bad set of uh, uh, drawings to kind of start developing your ideas on, you'll run into a lot of problems. So we wanted to have a clean, clear uh, set of drawings which we could map with. We hired this PhD who is a kind of expert in uh, in GIS, and we started to build huge data sets of, uh, of all this information from databases around the world. And it was very fascinating because what we started to see was um, all the black dots are basically oil uh, reservoirs and oil deposits, and all the red is basically pipelines and, and oil and gas infrastructure, which is in place in the world. And so we basically made hundreds and hundreds of, of these maps, and I won't, I'm not going to show all of them, I'm just going to show a few, but here's all the oil spills that happened uh, in the last hundred years. This is the Deep Sea Horizon by BP, which a lot of people know about, but actually when you look at the history of oil spills, it's just one uh, small event in a chain of a lot of other huge ecological disasters. Um, we also looked at uh, the, the, the most wealthy corporations in the world, the top 30 most profitable companies, 15 of them are oil and gas companies, which started to also make sense why the lobbies are so strong and so kind of powerful when, when you're going up against them when you're talking about renewable energy and why there's such an opposition. Uh, this is uh, coal plants in the world. This is uh, gas-powered plants. And so on and so on, and uh, and solar, where the solar was actually happening and being sort of developed. Uh, this is where hydro is kind of uh, situated, uh, wind turbines, etc. Then after this, while we were simultaneously making this book, we we started. We were just. Um, our desks were covered in reports of data which just didn't make sense. Everyone was talking about 
terawatts, gigahertz, like uh, just these numbers that you just don't really know what they are and you start to have to kind of research all these things and try to understand what, what they're talking about. And it, it just became like huge numbers which didn't make any sense or didn't connect to anybody. And so what we, what we started to do in this book is we started to call it the manifacto, which is basically the manifestation of facts. And we started to try to take these facts and make them accessible to people so they could understand what the situation was. So we all kind of inherently know that there's a lot of pollution in China. When you go there, you can feel it, you can sense it. But we started to sort of say, okay, well, 33% of the urban situation in China is the equivalent of smoking two packs of cigarettes per day. I mean, that's the kind of like the, the sort of situation that's actually happening there and that has other huge consequences from a kind of um, ecological but also kind of medical sort of situation. Um, the U.S. is, this is the, these are carbon footprints from around the world and how, how big they are and who's who are the, the arch polluters, let's say. Uh, you know, it also has a byproduct through different kind of reports. 3,000 people die with lung cancer, 40,000 people with heart attacks annually. So those all are also uh, costs that have to be kind of considered and thought about. Rebuilding infrastructure, which often taxpayers have to pay after a kind of major uh, storm that was maybe perhaps caused by CO2 uh, increases and in, in global warming. That also has, you know, gets starts to get into the trillions of, of uh, uh, investment. We projected forward um, that by 2050 there would be one-fifth of global GDP would be dedicated just to kind of like fixing all the broken uh, infrastructure that was created by kind of global warming. So we started to try to connect uh, the dots a little bit and make it more real for people because it was so abstract. It was also so, uh, make it more real for us because we were trying to also understand what the kind of implications and what we could do as architects and how we could communicate that. Um, another uh, statistic, you know, that uh, 1% or 0.1% of the ocean could provide basically enough energy for the whole world if we kind of tripled our population. Um, Four-fifths of the world lives next to the ocean so that there, it's, it's a kind of very accessible uh, source of power which we're just not even like thinking about. It's just right there, you know, and we haven't, I mean, of course, if we can innovate sort of like nuclear weapons and things, I'm, I'm sure if we put some smart people together, they could figure out a way to extract some of this energy. 1.3% uh, of the Sahara Desert uh, with concentrated solar panel could power all of Europe. I mean, we would basically have our whole kind of um, energy problem solved, you know. It's just very kind of simple things. So we started also mapping where the solar potential of the world could be and how we could actually kind of really make an intervention. And then when you start looking at, at this scale, you start to see that actually solar starts to really make sense, not even in Europe, but actually really in Africa. You know, we need to focus on Africa maybe. Uh, and then so by compiling all this data and all these hundreds and hundreds of maps and data sets, we start to kind of make um, conclusions and assumptions that certain areas of the world could be really kind of interesting to kind of develop and invest and, and, and sort of uh, make it more kind of um, uh, articulated of how those things could, could be kind of formulated. And then building that into a, a kind of an energy network, a global energy network, which could tie into this North Sea, which could tie into uh, the European Union. Union, um, network and actually connect the entire world into a sort of sustainable network. I mean, of course, this is an incredibly ambitious idea uh, and it will take a long time, but it, it is possible and it actually it does in a lot of ways make sense when you start to look at the investment costs uh, of how this could actually be rolled out as opposed to all the kind of um, costs that we have to pay and collateral damage to all these other uh, kind of technologies which are happening right now. And so, the, con the main conclusion that we found, just to kind of simplify everything down into a sort of more clear uh, um, uh, diagram, is that basically every continent has around five times the renewable energy potential than they do fossil fuel potential. And so it just makes sense to kind of focus on that because there's just more of it, you know? And so that was our conclusion here. The only exception is uh, uh, the Middle East has more fossil fuel potential than the renewable potential. But, you know, if you look at this, you start to see that, uh, what, you start to question, what are we actually doing? 
So the paradox of all this, and I'm going to go into this a little bit more and go, go back to this, uh, this graph, is that even after uh, 10 years of kind of analysis and research and more and more verification, there still doesn't seem to be enough action. Uh, and this was a kind of diagram that we made where we were saying, why is it that even when it makes sense, even when it's even more economically feasible, it still is not actually happening? And I think one of the things that is not calculated into our economic models is the collateral damage and the, the kind of the cost to health, cost to security, cost to cleanup, cost to environmental damage, conflicts, military, all these other things, they actually have costs which we pay for, but they're not included into the kind of economic formula. And of course, we still have all the lobbies which are very active and very present. I mean, you don't notice them, you don't see them, but they're actually, in a way, indirectly influencing the, the work that we do as architects and as urban designers, that they start to f uh, shape the world that we live in and operate in. And of course, we have propaganda, where they create fear campaigns for loss of jobs. Um, and then it leads to things like this, the BP, um, the Deep Sea Horizon that happened in 2011. You know, this was an offshore oil rig where something just, someone made a mistake and it actually had an enormous kind of ecological impact. It's hard to measure the kind of impact of these things because it, it goes into so many generations and so many other sort of uh, kind of issues where things become, uh, animals and plants become extinct or damaged, or, which are unrepairable. But the Wall Street Journal basically put a price tag on the kind of cleanup cost. They, they said it was about 54 billion. BP has to pay 18 billion. So the rest, the other kind of, uh, you know, 30 odd billion has to be picked up. The bill has to be picked up by the taxpayers, which didn't actually have anything to do with this. But so we're all kind of in it together in a way and we're all sort of going along with this whole scheme but it, that's something that we have to be aware of is that there is this reality and of course the, what was shocking to me was that Trump in the last campaign he was advocating coal and coal is just like the most ridiculous kind of uh, energy source because we know it's been proven that it's two or three times worse than any other uh, you know polluter than any other kind of like a source that exists so to actually start advocating it and actually reintroduce it is the completely wrong approach. I mean, the World Bank and the um, the International Health uh, Metrics um, Evaluation Committee basically did an analysis, a global analysis, and they said it's about 225 billion of costs associated to this uh, uh, pollution through asthma, heart disease, stroke, asthma, uh, um, uh, uh, heart conditions, and heart attacks. Um, another industry which w kind of is really under the radar, maybe too much under the radar, and they've actually been greenwashing the, themselves to uh, a large degree is the nuclear energy industry, which they, it's true, they don't produce any CO2, which is, which is great. The only problem is that they produce a lot of uh, byproduct called uh, radioactive waste. And actually nobody really talks about it, nobody really looks into it, but it's an enormous issue. Uh, just to give you a sense of scale, the nuclear industry always says, oh yeah, well, it'll go away over time. But what they're talking about is, this is the evolution of man, from ape to man. This little red line here is basically civilization as we know it. So from Egypt to the European Union. And this is how long it takes to become not an issue for uh, humans. So this is how long it actually may, it becomes toxic and it has kind of cancer causing agents. So basically it's millions of generations before it goes away. So it's not going away anytime soon. So it's something we have to take into consideration of what is the actual cost of this. So I know another kind of bizarre thing that we found is that the European Union is, is extremely strict with nuclear waste. So every uh, nuclear reactor actually stores the nuclear waste next to the reactor is a temporary storage until we can figure out what to do with it. But no one for the last 50 years has figured out what to do with it yet. But what's happening is somehow this nuclear waste is ending up in the hands of the mafia, and uh, there's been about uh, maybe 20 or so cases, or even some people say 30 or 40 cases, where they basically have been uh, somehow taking nuclear waste, putting it on a ship, 
taking the ship out to sea and sinking it in the Mediterranean, and I'm sure in other places around the world. And these barrels are basically there, sealed at the bottom of the ocean. I mean, they haven't started leaking yet, but it's going to become a kind of like ticking time bomb of a kind of ecological disaster. So the European Union is aware of all this, um, and they're trying to figure out what to do because you know it also has a hefty price tag. And how do you deal with it? And you know, should we solve it now, or the longer we wait, it becomes more of a problem. But the problem actually is th is that there isn't a solution for these companies, and the companies somehow are are kind of being trusted with this thing which they shouldn't actually be trusted with. So maybe we shouldn't actually be uh, you know using this at all. That becomes a, a bigger kind of question. And then the other kind of eerie kind of situation is the, the Fukushima uh, reactor meltdown, which we all sort of witnessed recently. Um, the kind of, the very creepy thing about it is that actually they knew this would probably happen. Uh, they knew that the, the backup generators were in the basement where if there was a tsunami that would pose a problem. And they actually just didn't do anything about it because it was too expensive. But now, we're now stuck with 9.5 million tons of nuclear waste, which is basically piled up next to the reactor. And it's actually not so big of a problem for Japan, but it's actually becoming a kind of problem for the rest of the world, where this is the, the traces of this radioactive material, which is basically now in the, the Pacific Ocean and how it's moving around in the world. And it will be there for millions of years. So that, this is a kind of big issue. They've already started uh, stopping um, uh, fishing and crabbing in, in uh, California, and it's basically spreading. So this is something just to be aware of that we have, um, you know, we should be more active as architects and urban planners of, because we're basically designing cities, and cities require energy. We should be more critical about where this energy is coming from and how can we actually reduce the impact through design to make it less of a kind of issue. So uh, Forbes tried to put a number on this. Of course, it was like uncalculatable. Uh, I mean, it gets just starts to get into kind of like totally bizarre numbers because you basically make a, a 30 to 50 kilometer area around uh, next to Tokyo uh, uninhabitable. Uh, so if you just look at the property devaluation on that alone, it starts to get into the trillions, you know. And that basically, what the other bizarre thing is that nuclear isn't even profitable; it, it runs on subsidies. So it actually doesn't even make sense from an economic perspective. If you then if you add this into the mix, it just is a complete disaster from a kind of um, you know uh, formula for how we actually produce and consume energy. <laughs> So this, um, we work a lot with Hans Ulrich Olbrist, and I think this is more just for the, the, the upcoming generation of architects and designers, is that we should also think about what we focus our energy on and what is really urgent to focus our energy on and, um, and our and intelligence. And I think the fact that um, we're kind of in a kind of crisis situation right now with the kind of uh, the whole sustainability issues of how much energy and how much kind of resources that we're using is starting to kind of take off and is becoming um, an issue that we have to address. Um, and I think we need to address it through better economic formulas. I mean, this is, a, uh, there's, there's different sort of models of how we use economics. We're currently using this economic model, which is basically the levelized cost of energy, which essentially is a very simple formula where it's just like uh, how much stuff the lifetime versus the energy produced is a kind of number. It doesn't take into any account the byproducts, all the other kind of negative consequences. So this basically makes the the kind of graph which we always see published look like this, where basically offshore wind and onshore wind and photovoltaics don't make sense. And actually coal and gas and nuclear are super efficient. But actually, if you start to look at other economic models, one is the society's cost of electricity, which is another kind of metric of how you can calculate it with different parameters. It looks a little bit more like this, so then all of a sudden uh, photovoltaics and onshore and offshore start to become very appealing. And then if you actually use a different model, which is looking at all the external costs, it just starts to make total sense to kind of shift away from uh, what we're ac how we're actually kind of um, con consuming uh, at the current state. But I aside from all the lobbies and all the kind of uh, things uh, that are happening, which are basically slowing down the development of renewables, 
it's actually happening anyway because the costs are coming down. People are becoming more aware that it's actually being kind of implemented, but it's on such a small scale that it's just almost having no impact at the moment. In our office, this is just a project that we did. I'll quickly touch on it. We, we look a little bit at uh, trying to understand the economic or the ecological footprint of how we design cities. Um, and basically what that comes down to is if you really get into it, you can start to see where you can actually make a lot of savings and where you can compress things and make them more efficient. You can actually reduce the, economic, the ecological footprint by almost 90% if you integrate that into the design process and into the brief and into the kind of urban planning process. We've been analyzing a lot of cities which are off-grid, which are very kind of fascinating and interesting kind of models of how they work, mainly out of necessity. And we've started to kind of like organize how those things could actually look physically and how they would actually be sort of, uh, how it would uh, impact our design and how we should actually formulate briefs to be more uh, integrated where we could actually design things that are completely off-grid. And I think that comes, when I was here last year for uh, for a kind of a, a guest review and they took me to um, this off-grid campus that you guys have, which I thought was extremely relevant and extremely fascinating to kind of see how you guys are developing that and integrating integrating that into your curriculum, and I think that more schools should do that, actually, because it, it's so relevant and it's so urgent at the moment. Of course, there's people like Elon Musk, who's the kind of uh, billionaire kind of entrepreneur who's doing all these sort of uh, interesting sort of innovations in the US. He developed Tesla cars, now he's developed this kind of battery pack that can be uh, in your garage, and now he just launched a solar roof that's completely integrated. Solar panels are integrated into the shingles, so you can't even tell it that it's a solar roof anymore. It's apparently cheaper than a normal roof, and so he's actually basically empowering people to create their own house, uh, making it kind of off-grid where they can produce their own energy for their own consumption, produce their own fuel for their own car, and he's actually making a business case uh, around this, which I think is extremely fascinating, and I think he's probably having more of an impact on the urban environment than all architects combined that are working on sustainability, so I think that we need to move a little bit more in this direction where we use our design intelligence to actually scale it up and make an impact to kind of really make a difference. Uh, he's building a, a new battery um, uh, factory, which is basically going to take the 35,000 electric cars currently today, and he's, he wants to um, scale it up to 50 or 500,000 cars. So basically, more electric cars than all the world production combined. Uh, he's building it at the moment. This is it under construction. And there's also a lot of new breakthroughs in battery technology, which are just happening now. So I think there's a huge uh, potential, which is just about to kind of, we're just on the cusp of like what's really going to happen. And I think this is even moving away from lithium batteries. This is now this new kind of uh, battery, which is just being developed with MIT, which is going to change everything. And so, I mean, in our office, we think about renewable energy on a very, very big scale, because that's where we can really have an impact. And we think that if we're going to think about renewable energy, we, we should do it big. But we still try to integrate these ideas and the kind of principles into our own buildings in a very modest way. So this is the Stads Contour that was just recently built in, um, in Rotterdam. It was renamed as the Timmer House, but basically the idea is that there's uh, a residential on the on the top. There's deep offices uh, in the middle, and then the ground floor is a public museum, and the. The, what we did here was we actually used very high uh, coefficient um, materials that were extremely energy uh, um, uh, resilient and, and sustainable. We used a very quick kind of and, and, and simple kind of construction techniques to, to make it um, easy and cheap to build. So we built atriums inside, which are passive systems to move air and heat through the building throughout the year. And, and we made basically um, uh, the most sustainable mixed-use building in the Netherlands, but it doesn't look like a sustainable building it, as what a lot of people think sustainability looks like. And I think that that's sort of what, we, what we're also trying to do is try to change the way that we think about sustainability, which is a little bit in the lines of Elon Musk, where he wanted to make a sustainable car that didn't look like a kind of green smart car, but looked like a Maserati, and he did it, and it's actually sustainable. And I think that that's something that we can also integrate into our entire design process as architects. And so just to conclude, um, back to Buckminster Fuller, I think that you have to start changing the system uh, that exists to actually be able to um, make an impact and a change. So thank you very much.
over to Tana. So thank you so much, Tana. Um, to be honest, today I've been like on a sustainable emotional roller coaster because I started my day off reading about how um, the Velasquez, Valdez sorry, oil spill in Alaska was actually considered the most prosperous moment um, of, for Alaska because of the fact that because all the people had to go up to Alaska to clean the oil spill, um, it actually incremented the GDP for Alaska and so it was considered, I guess, a positive outcome of a very negative effect and how there's heavy metals in polyester and they're causing cancer and everything. So your first half of your presentation really took me up, um, imagining a very positive and renewable future for Europe and then you sort of destroyed me in the beginning of the second half again, slowly taking us up again. So thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to invite anyone who has any questions for Tana to just raise their hand. Front row. Hi, thanks for the lecture. More than a question, it's a kind of comment. Because uh, it seems that uh, in the very recent uh, news and events, the world is coming backwards in a way. We have re-exit, we have Trump effect. So I think this is going to have a huge effect in, in obviously, in what is happening uh, globally, but also in some local markets. In this regard, I, I'm just curious, because of course, uh, there are a lot of uh, think tanks, institutions, etc., that are thinking forward. However, there is another kind of social political agenda that is in a way driving uh, most of uh, the forces worldwide. Uh, I don't know if you have something to add in that regard, at least in the next coming four years' time. Yeah, I think, I mean, it's a really good question. I think it's been also on my mind a lot. And I, I, one of the people that has really influenced now our work in AMO is uh, an economist called, uh, his name is Thomas Piketty. And I don't know if you know uh, this economist, but he's extremely interesting. He'll probably win a Nobel Prize in the coming uh, five years or so. But basically, what he's showing is he starts to extrapolate data over longer periods of time and bigger data sets, which starts to lead to new kind of insights into to how economics actually works and the byproducts of those uh, systems. And I think that we're, we're really in the market economy and I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. But I think the only way that we can really subvert it is that we start to need, need to use more inclusive economic models so that we get a more clear picture of what's really happening and what's actually profitable and what's not profitable. Because right now there's a kind of... Um, distortion which is happening because a lot of data is actually being cut out of the the calculation so everything looks right on paper but actually it doesn't add up if you really look at the numbers so i think that we need to sort of subvert the the market economy with the market economy in a way Um, I would just like to make it make it more clear. So, for example, some people, and I'm one of them, would be like, "Okay, it's so late." Especially when I see like I'm only one person, and the decision makers, and as the photo you showed, for example, the United States and the Gulf and all this stuff. Like the real, the people who are really damaging this are really big countries or really strong political thing models, not real individuals. So, I would like to talk, you to talk about how powerful can we be to change this. And like for example, you, Omar was was collaborating with Tony Fadel on his project with the embedded systems inside houses. Yes. So this would drive people as individuals to be to be helping to save this. So how relevant do you think this scale in making a change would be? I mean, I, I think that we just have to start to think about what we can contribute and what we can't contribute. And that was one of the things I tried to make clear is that, you know, a lot uh, architects are kind of contributing in a lot of ways to sustainability by working inside of the framework which exists, which maybe we should actually try to get out of that framework because it doesn't make sense to have a kind of completely inefficient urban uh, grid network and, and uh, you know, where basically millions of homes are kind of connected to a system 
system which is basically broken and then you have one building with a very energy efficient window detail, it basically doesn't do anything to solve the problem. It's sort of like trying to take water out of a giant ship with a teaspoon. The only way you can really solve it is you have to sort of look at the magnitude of the situation and change your scale of thinking to how you can actually use design and use intelligence to sort of try to ship, make models which can actually be either scaled up or have a bigger impact than only working inside of a kind of broken network. I think that that's sort of, I mean, I, of course we should still make sustainable buildings and we should try to do our best in, in that framework, but I think we have to think bigger than we are and that's sort of what became really interesting for us in the office is that it, it, sustainability all of a sudden starts to make sense when you work on a big scale and that was why we were also a bit skeptical originally of it is it didn't seem like even if we were really making a difference on a kind of very small sort of boutique level of sustainability it actually wasn't really making any difference so that was for us where we became much more enthusiastic in, in the efforts started to all kind of add up so I think that to answer your question just you have to shift your way of thinking about it and uh, try to make sure that whatever you do leaves some kind of an impact uh, my question is, uh, if AMO is really having these all environmental concerns now, why OMA is still building the same way? And uh, you showed us the, the Rotterdam building. Your, your main comment was on the efficiency of, in terms of, of the program. Not even the, you didn't mention anything about sustainability in terms of environmental issues and concerns. Uh, what do you think about it? This kind of I mean, I, gap, I think, gap between your yeah. studies and the way you construct. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. I mean, the, I tried to show the example at the end where uh, we are, all the buildings that we are doing actually are sustainable in a lot of ways, you know, and I mean, we are, we are building a lot in the same way, but we're also more aware of what we're doing and we're trying to have an impact. So for instance, the, the Timmer House, which was built at basically the exact same time as the Rotterdam, is the most sustainable building in the Netherlands according to all the sustainability indexes, but it doesn't look like, it looks like one of our normal buildings. So we're kind of camouflaging the, the ideas and technology into the kind of development of our of our kind of um, normal architectural projects. But we are also aware that that's not, th this is not our core kind of I idea in the office. I mean, this is just a fascination we have of hundreds of fascinations. And this is one sort of area where we've been working and, and looking at, but it's not the kind of core focus of our office. But we, it's just that our office, we're also, I could make, you know, uh, 20 different presentations which are totally maybe contradictory or different but the idea is that we're just trying to understand the world that we're working in and the political and economic conditions where we are kind of operating as architects and how we can actually make a kind of better or bigger or more interesting sort of intervention. So it's, yeah, of course we, we are aware but there's also limitations of what you can do. You know, you're still also working in a system uh, with clients with kind of uh, economic conditions you have, there's limited means, but it's also liberating to know what is possible and what you can do. And when you can actually change it, you can intervene at the right moment. So. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Tamar, for, for your actually very political talk. No? And, and I think it is important to, to speak about politics because we are at a very critical moment where we're facing challenges of, of not only environment and sustainability but also um, economical challenges and, and most of all social challenges. No? Many of the things that you are, we're putting on the screen today, they are much more related with a deeper social crisis rather than a political or rather than an environmental one. No? And um, I think that um, I might get the question, or maybe the, the thinking, I don't know if it is a question, back to the issue of scale. Because it's not always easy to deal with bigger scale, because bigger scale requires, um, um, uh, requires the, the, the inclusion of, of decision makers, no? Because it always, it's always about what kind of regulations you're dealing of, no? Like a few years back we have uh, built a, a solar house, a house that was able 
able to generate the energy that it needed, but we couldn't connect it to the grid because the grid was a, was a monopoly of, of, an, of a company that it was not allowing such buildings to be connected. Therefore, we were able to generate our energy during summer, but we were not able to store it because technology of storage of energy is still very, very uh, primitive, and we were not having energy during winter. So guess what? We were not sustainable, no? And that's because the infrastructure was not there. So I think that by just thinking big, it's, it's kind of limited in terms of what we can act upon, no? And I'm saying that because I also see um, and work in projects that they are working in a much smaller scale. For example, I think that innovation is something very important that you haven't been talking about from different disciplines. Um, um, you were showing your last project uh, um, ideas of how you can apply different kind of, of advanced materials uh, or, or like passive uh, systems of cooling and heating in, in a kind of a traditional way of using other kind of materials such as glass or steel, etc. And, and I wonder, whereas you think that innovation that comes from other disciplines such as um, bioengineering no? that, or biology that is, is presenting materials that they can replace photovoltaic panels, that they are much cheaper, that they can grow in, 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 in bigger scales, that they are based only in growing plants, just as an, just an example, no? or, or other kind of, of, um, um, uh, of operations such as uh, small neighborhoods trying to produce their own food or small neighborhoods trying to uh, 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 even even, let's say, transform their own cars into something that it is much more electrical or sustainable. Uh, how do you see these kind of smaller scale actions really making difference? Because if we believe that the revolution will come from top down or from big scale to bigger, I think that is um, not very optimistic for the future, no? Oh, I mean, I think it's a, it's also an interesting question. It's similar to the kind of some of the other sort of uh, topics that we've been talking about. But I think that for us, that's one of the reasons why we are interested in having this other side office, AMO, because it allows us to engage with other disciplines and other industries and other people outside of the architectural, the, the normal sort of... Uh, usual suspects of the consultants where you're working on as a building and it engages with other kinds of conversations and other kinds of uh, things that you would never be able to kind of uncover through Google or through through other sort of means but it allows it starts to create an interesting sort of dialogue and a collaboration similar to what we talked about at the very beginning of the lecture where everyone here is from 40 different nationalities they have different backgrounds and that actually collision creates interesting sort of dialogue and I think that we need to do that more as a profession in general to kind of go beyond uh, our own sort of comfort zone and get into other kind of conversations. And I think what we can contribute a lot as architects, and that's basically what we've been doing a lot in AMO, is just sort of almost operating as the sort of na naive kind of consultant at the table, but actually just showing the obvious in a very graphic, very visual way to make it so obvious that people start to kind of shift their thinking. So that's one way you can kind of intervene in a very subtle way is just basically by communicating and visualizing things to make it more accessible to people on a very small scale I think you know you you just need to be more like on a very very small scale I mean, just as kind of anecdotal but like for our house at our, at our home there's different energy options you can choose for who, who provides your energy and a lot of people just choose the cheapest price but if you actually follow that number it leads somewhere and it leads to some other thing and so in our house we pay a little bit more but when we use wind energy to power our house so that's on a very very simple skill you can just make that kind of decision but I think you just need to be more aware of and communicate to people how they can actually make those small kind of consumer choices which actually make a bigger impact if enough people do it and it's scaled up in a, in a way and I think just on a, this example you gave of the solar house 
being disconnected from the grid. I think uh, this is all. This is the the whole problem. Uh, actually, on a macro scale of the whole renewable argument, which I was gave that diagram of this finger holding the scale, is that in a way all this technology is there, but there's there's people blocking it, like this company, not allowing you to uh, connect to their grid, not allowing lithium batteries in Spain, not allowing like certain things. But I think technology is also changing so fast that they're not going to be able to keep up anymore and it will start to slip away. Maybe then you can use a different type of battery, a different type of storage technique. You, I think we just have to be smarter than what is available and if there's if one direction to kind of like intervene doesn't work, then we have to try a different direction and we don't give up. You know, I think that's the, the also the way as architects we have to kind of outsmart the system and be more, I mean our, our kind of biggest asset is our ability to be creative and sort of shift the way we normally would do things and change the kind of approach uh, or, or kind of reinvent uh, something that doesn't exist yet, you know? And I think that that's something that, that we have um, innately sort of in our training, uh, the ability, but we're not exploiting it maybe enough and we could do it more, so. Okay, so thanks so much, Tana. Um, if everyone could just thank Tana once again with a nice round of applause. <laughs> and beers are at the back.